let's move on to intermittent fasting. So you describe a 14 hour overnight fast as the Goldilocks zone. Why, why is that window ideal and, and what happens uh, overnight to our cells while we're in that fasted kind of period? There are so many ways to intermittent fast and the type that I advocate from the lens of hormesis is time-restricted eating. So all of your eating in a certain number of hours. And um, I think from there, what that time interval of eating should be depends on multiple variables. Um, those would include what your health goals are. Um, for example, if um, your goal is longevity versus improving metabolic health, um, reversing disease versus prevention. So those goals can affect the time frame. And um, your current health um, is a variable, your gender is a variable, your age is a variable. So the reason, you know, so I'll start by saying that I think um, kind of a normal eating pattern really should be trying to eat all of your calories in a 12-hour window. And that's largely because your body needs to go um, kind of more than 12 hours to enter um, some of these housekeeping functions that trigger repair um, and uh, the recycling that is so critical for our health. And if we're in a less than 12-hour window, we aren't doing a lot of these repair processes. So our bodies and our cells can either be in one phase or another. Our cells can either be growing and proliferating or they can be repairing and they can either be building up energy storage, they can be breaking down energy storage. So it's either one or the other. And an imbalance between the two um, is what leads to disease. So if we have too much energy storage relative to breakdown, that takes us down a path of metabolic disease. If we have too much growth in our cells, which sounds really good, but essentially too much growth can lead to diseases like cancer, et cetera. You have to balance that out with repair mechanisms at the cellular level. Um, so 12 hours kind of helps us stay in the balance that our bodies are meant to be in. Beyond that, getting to this um, extended um, window of 14 hours of fasting or 10 hours of eating window, that optimizes for metabolic health, which again is such a key component of our overall health. Because one of the first things that happens when we do intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating is improvements in metabolic health, primarily improvements in insulin sensitivity or reduction in insulin resistance. Part of that is because when we are in a fasted state, we are utilizing our glycogen stores, and we're breaking down fat for energy, um, which our body converts to ketones. Our cells want to become very energy efficient. They want to uptake whatever glucose is available. And when we recover from the fasting period, they want to store the glycogen more effectively, kind of overcome insulin resistance so that when we fast again, the next day of repetition, that we are, you know, have that ability to take in more glucose into our cells. So um, this ability to overcome insulin resistance is one of the key things that happens within that time frame. You can certainly do longer time periods. You know, for example, if your goal is deeper states of autophagy, longer time periods would make sense because if you, again, think of a cell as you know, trying to use the energy that's available when you're in the fasted state, at the first level, you're going to uptake the glucose that's around, become more insulin sensitive, become more metabolically efficient. Then the body has to use what it already has. So if there are cells that are older, that are damaged, they'll try and repair those cells to become more efficient, or it will recycle those cells and use some of those components for energy. So that is, you know, essentially autophagy, a self-eating process. So that's a deeper um, state of um, energy deprivation that get that activates that. So again, you could do these longer states, but I think the sweet spot when you balance kind of health in a more holistic way. When you take into consideration, you know, what's practical, what's feasible 
So time restricted eating in really even as small as an eight hour window, let alone trying to do it in a 10 hour window in a year long study. I don't think we have much longer than that, but um, in in the Annals of Internal Medicine, there's certainly a year long study that showed about 87% success rate. Um, So it seems very feasible. It certainly has been shown to be safe. Um, And I think that that is kind of a sweet spot for metabolic health, shorter time windows, um, add very small incremental benefit to that 10 hour time frame. And the 10 hours also allows you to get adequate protein intake. Um, certainly when I've tried to shorten my window, I think it's very challenging to, to get your daily protein intake. Um, so when you think of health in a holistic way, balancing what your energy needs are, giving yourself enough time to get that. Um, That's kind of where um, I've kind of landed with this 14 hour or 10 hour um, eating 14 hour fasting window. How do you feel about some of the more extreme fasting examples that people might come across online? And I think I know how people arrive there. If If I think about my own sort of eating window, I've eaten in a 10 hour eating window for three, four years. And I will say that it's now just a habit and it's not uncomfortable for me. So now I'm actually second guessing, is that dose right? Is this something I have to push and do I have to narrow that window even more to get the benefits of fasting? Or am I risking, like you said just then, that I'm eating in in now in such a narrow window that I'm not getting enough total calories or protein or micronutrients to support my um, activity levels. And so I think what we see out there online, you see these examples of people who maybe started with a 10 hour eating window, but then two, three, four, five years down the track, all of a sudden they're doing three, five days with no food, you know, doing that regularly. Like how does someone how does someone know what the appropriate dose is for them? Again, I think you have to start with a question of what are your goals, right? So if it's deeper levels of autophagy, which, you know, potentially, you know, even though we don't know the effect on longevity, um, and there's maybe some preliminary data on some regenerative ability in pancreatic islet cells from these deeper, longer fasts, I mean, there's, there's a potential place for them. I'm coming at it from the perspective of hormesis and what is optimal when we look at a lifestyle that we should be living for longevity and disease prevention. And that window, that you know, 14 hour fasting window, 10 hour eating window is really the the optimal for triggering that mild to moderate stress. So again, as we talked about earlier, when you stress yourself in a um, kind of beyond a mild to moderate amount, there's a limit to how much resilience you can build from that exposure. So kind of pushing beyond um, or even, you know, stacking different stressors, you don't always gain more benefit. Like our body just doesn't work that way. Um, When you look at it from activating all of our disease resistant mechanisms um, that can be activated by these stressors. So, so for me, I think that is why this is such a sweet spot. It's you want that mild to moderate and it's that daily pattern that I think is helping you of stress, recovery, stress, recovery. Again, this recovery piece is key. When you do an extended multi-day fast, the the recovery is when your body does the growing of the preferentially healthier cells. So the fasting without the recovery on a regular basis um, is, is, I think, a missing piece in all of this. If we're looking at this as a habit for a lifetime, And then with the more extended fast, the challenge, I mean, I've done some of those and the challenge I've run into is um, I just simply cannot work out at a level that I would like to. And when my dietary intake is limiting my ability to do exercise, which I think is so important um, as a, again, this is now I'm thinking of this as a lifestyle practice, then to me, whatever I'm gaining, there's clearly something I'm losing. With the uh, 14-hour 
a day fasting, so eating in the 10-hour eating window. Do you have any thoughts on stacking that with exercise, particularly cardio? I know a lot of people are, are interested in this idea of fasted cardio. If you get up in the morning and you're you're in that period of 14 hours of fasting and you go and do your cardio, are there additional benefits up for grabs? Are you stressing some of these biological aging pathways a little more? Yeah, you know, this is such a, a great question and um, so many nuances to finding that optimal stacking. So um, part of it is going to be what is that workout, right? If you are doing a zone two workout, um, then it, you potentially could get an added effect. Um, if you are doing a high intensity interval workout, that higher stress plus being in a fasted state um, could potentially um, be too much of a stressor to your body. That can, you know, again, the reason I say this is because when you're in a fasted state, your body is already looking at your fats as your primary source of energy. And you're using ketones in that fasted state. If you're doing a zone two where you're primarily using the oxidative phosphor phosphorylation pathway relying on mitochondrial fat burning, in that zone, some stacking could be beneficial. If you're trying to do a high intensity interval workout where you're trying to use um, part of the anaerobic glycolytic pathway along with the oxidative phosphorylation, the mitochondrial pathway of energy, then you, you simply don't have um, the ability to, I mean, you just don't have the glycogen stores at that point. So you'll probably bonk and that may be just too much of a stressor. And so again, it depends on the type of workout and another layer to add to that are potential gender differences. Um, so women are more energy or, or nutrient sensitive. And um, part of that is just evolutionarily based. So if, um, you know, women were to conceive a child and our ancestors were faced in an environment of, you know, inadequate food or starvation, it would not be optimal for a woman to conceive. So women have just become more nutrient sensitive. That's one proposed reason for it. Um, why the lack of incoming nutrients can be sensed as a greater stress. So there could be some gender differences in the ability to exercise in that fasted state. So women may need more fuel going into that cardio workout, even if it's a zone two workout. Yes. Um, you know, and this is, again, there's going to be so much individual variability that it's very um, hard to make a kind of overarching generalizations, but there's certainly a, a potential for that to happen. You know, the, the challenge here that we're facing is that we're talking about healthy men and healthy women. And the reality is that um, most of our country is metabolically unhealthy, um, relying more on the kind of glycolytic pathways because when mitochondria are impaired, our ability for fat utilization is decreased. So we rely more on um, our glycolytic uh, pathway that uses um, glucose for energy creation. And as a, a result of that, I think it becomes very challenging um, to exercise in a fasted state for people with metabolic disease as well, but it is also hugely beneficial. Um, so I think it's just finding um, where what feels right as an individual. And if we go back to this overarching principle that with good stress, you feel good afterwards, you feel energized with kind of harmful stress or when you've pushed too much, you feel fatigued and unwell. That's kind of the overarching framework for trying to see if whatever intervention you're doing is helping you or not. 
I am absolutely excited to share an exclusive offer with the Proof community. This is a limited time offer just for my audience and no doctor referral is needed. Function Health is a comprehensive at-home blood testing service that gives you access to over 100 biomarkers, covering everything from heart, liver, kidney, and metabolic health to hormone levels, inflammation, and nutrient status. That, my friends, is five times more testing than the average physical. I chose Function for my own blood work and to be a sponsor of this show because they are the best in the world when it comes to helping you understand and own your health. It's true, the depth and quality of their testing is unrivaled. And as regular listeners of this show will know, you cannot optimize what you don't measure. Don't guess, test. Use function to know exactly where your health is today, and then intervene with evidence-based medicine and lifestyle changes to feel your best and reduce your risk of chronic disease. With Function, you get access to very important markers like LP little a, a genetically driven cardiovascular risk factor, APOB, the most predictive marker of atherosclerosis, and LH and FSH, reproductive hormones typically missing from standard lab panels. It's not uncommon for these biomarkers and others to be elevated. For example, over 50% of Function members have an APOB level, and over 20% have an LPA little level that is above the optimal range. You can even add on harder to access tests like cystatin C, a very sensitive marker of kidney function, as well as selenium and iodine nutrients that are essential for thyroid and overall health, yet rarely tested. So what are you waiting for? Run over to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill today and be one of 1000 listeners to score a $100 credit. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.